Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Gaffering Gear. Today we're going to have a look at the Godox LD150R RGB WW panel. It's 150 watts, has a CCT range from 2,500 Kelvin all the way up to 8,500 Kelvin and it has all of the modes you'd expect from a full RGB WW panel. The unit also boasts DMX. All right, so let's go through how much it costs and what you get for your money. So it sells for about 1,000 US dollars and roughly about 1,500 AUD. So you get a very well constructed bag. Uh, you get a set of barn doors. Okay, so we'll talk about the barn doors later. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of barn doors on panel lights. Okay, a bit of padding. You get the light, of course. The light is very well constructed, I've got to say, for the money. Um, I've got real, no real criticisms on how it's constructed, especially for the price. It's um, quite quite sturdy. Okay, you get a Velcro cable tie. You get a power cable, which connects to your uh, power supply. Okay, so that's pretty much all you get. Oh, you also get an instruction manual, and the instruction manual is uh, actually very clear and very concise. All right, so let's do a quick run through of the unit. So your stand mount here is a dual junior pin and baby pin. The stirrups here are quite lightweight, so it couldn't take a heavy modifier like say an Octodone, for example, like a DOP Choice Octodone with a snap grid on the front. I think it's uh, too flexible for that. But in terms of a soft box or something like that, no problem at all. Let's take a look at the front of the unit. Now, the LED array is under lenses with a light bit of diffusion over the front, so you do get multiple shadowing, particularly as your daylight and tungsten emitters are under different lenses, so you can get shadow echo. Now, you can get around that by uh, putting a light bit of diffusion over the barn doors, so that gets us onto our next thing. On the front here, these yellow bits are spring loaded, so that's for loading up your accessories like your barn doors or your honeycombs. All right, so let's have a look at that now. Now that's quite secure, it's not gonna fall out, but for added security, you do have a latch at the top here. Now I'm not a huge fan of barn doors on panel lights. I don't think they work all that well. Let's take a look. All right, so this is in full flood. I'll start closing the doors up. You can see it doesn't really do much for spill control, but what it does do is really show up the multiple shadowing. Now, if you're thinking I've got a lot of spill control here, I've got the barn doors nearly completely shut. The honeycomb is an additional extra, which sells for about 100 Australian dollars or about 75 US. Okay, let's have a look at the inlets and outlets. So we've got RJ45 DMX in and out. We've got DMX in and out five pin XLR, and we've got a USB port for firmware updates. That USB port can also phantom power a Lumen radio receiver. And we've got our DC inlet for 24 volts and our on off switch. Now you can also run this thing off batteries up here via the V-mount uh, plate. Now the V-mount option is 26 volts only. You can't run this off 14.4 or 14.8 volt. All right, so let's go through how to operate this unit and it really is fairly straightforward. All right, so we've got up in the top corner here our mode button. So if I press down that, all of our operation modes come up and it's icon driven. So you just use the yellow knob here to scroll between and when you get to the mode you want, you just press the yellow knob and you're in that mode. Now if I wanna go back to the previous menu, I just press the back button or to get back to this menu, I could just press the mode button. Now let's go back to our CCT mode here and press that. Okay, now down here we've got presets, so that's where you can save things. So I've got a few things saved already. Now I just wanna show you how easy it is to save something. So let's say we wanna change um, what we've got set here. Let's put, let's go to 8,500 Kelvin. If I wanna overwrite what I've got saved here, I'll just press the button down and hold it. And then it'll ask me if I want to overwrite, yes or no. So let's go yes. And I've got that saved. So it really is that simple to save and recall your settings. All right, let's have a closer look at some of our modes now. All right, let's start off having a look at the CCT mode. So our CCT mode, we've got a Kelvin range from two and a half thousand Kelvin in 100 Kelvin increments all the way up to eight and a half thousand Kelvin. Now, if I press the button, it'll jump between preset values. Now we also have a plus minus green uh, selection here as well. 
and we can dim the light in 1% increments. Now let's go to our next mode. Uh, the next mode here is RGB. I'm not going to cover RGB because that's a majorly boring mode. It's just four adjustments, red, green, blue, and white. Let's go to something more interesting. Let's go to the next one across, which is HSI. Now in our HSI mode, we've got our full color wheel, 360 colors. So I'll just scroll around that very quickly. And we can desaturate in 1% uh, increments. Now it does desaturate to a really blue white point. So I'm just gonna go right down to fully desaturated. So that is one of the negatives, so I'll get into that later. Now the next thing across in our menu system is our gels libraries. So the first one across is our Roscoe gels. Now the gels are listed in swatch book numbers. So you don't have uh, names, it's just numbers. So you might need a swatch book. Now there's only about 20 gels in this menu. So let's go back and have a look at the Lees menu. So the same thing, uh, they're listed in the swatch book numbers. And again, there's only about 20 or so gels here. Okay, let's go back. The next menu is effects. Now there's 14 effects here. This is candle and it looks pretty good. You know, compared to a lot of candle and effects um, or fire effects on a lot of lights, this looks pretty reasonable. Let's go down to fire, which is a little bit more, uh, more rapid. Now on all of the effects, if you press the yellow button, you've got um, up to three choices. Let's have a quick scroll through on some of the things here. We've got cop car, usual things like that. Um, we've got color chase, so that's pretty good. And you've got yeah, other popular things like um, your disco lights. All right, so let's have a look through the menu system. So the first couple of options are wireless and Bluetooth. So that's to do with mobile phone app operation. I no longer review mobile phone apps. I find half of them just don't work on my Android phones. And unless you've got a whole stack of lights to test on the phone app, you can't guarantee the phone app works reliably. All right, so let's go down. The next thing is DMX. So we've got a choice of follow or lead. So what that allows you to do is if you set this to lead and then run DMX to um, other lights like this or other, other identical lights to this, you can run the whole lot from the one light. So they can all operate as one unit. Uh, next thing down is fan. So you can turn the fan on and off. If you turn the fan off, it runs at half, half brightness. We've got screen brightness, language reset version, which tells you your firmware version and screen sleep. So that is the whole system. All right, so let's get into the pros and cons, starting off with the cons first. And this is a really big negative for me, and it's to do with the beam. So it's about a 40 to 45 degree beam, which is okay. But the issue I have is with the bleed off around it. So it's got quite a lot of bleed off either side of the hotspot. Now, the problem I have with this bleed off is it is very, very green. So it's got a lot of green hue to it. Now, here's the problem for you watching this. That green hue doesn't look that bad because my camera does a lot of processing of the image and anything it thinks is a green hue generated by lights, it removes and it does a very good job of it. So what I'm gonna do is have a look with the color spectrometer. All right, so let's go to roughly about the center of the beam here and take a reading. And we've got a Delta UV of plus 0.0018, which isn't too bad. That puts it pretty close to the daylight curve. But if I move over to here and I take another reading, that comes in at a Delta UV of 0.0113. So the difference between the two spots is roughly the equivalent of a one half correction gel. So if you were trying to light a large set with these and say have you know three or four of them in a lighting grid without any diffusion added to the front, you could have a set that has neutral, then green, then neutral, then green, then neutral, then green. So that's not so great. There is a way around that though, and that is you could put a diffusion gel on the front of these and mix everything together. Now, when I did this, I got a Delta UV score across the entire beam of 0.0043. So that means the center of the beam with the diffusion on is greener than it was before by about the equivalent of a one eighth correction gel. Now, of course, you could compensate for this with the plus minus green capability that the light has. So you could just enter in some magenta to compensate for that. But that brings me to my next negative. This plus minus green system has a really weird quirk. 
watch what happens when I start dimming the light. My magenta settings that I just entered in start to change. And then if I decide I want to turn my brightness back up, I've now lost the settings. Now this won't happen over DMX because your plus minus green is on a separate channel. Now the next thing I think is going to be a big negative for a lot of people is that this only runs off 26 volt V mounts. Now this is a low cost light so I'm guessing that people who are interested in buying this probably can't afford to go out and buy 26 volt V mount batteries. They're probably hoping to use their existing 14.4 or 14.8 volt batteries that they use for their camera system. Now my next negative is on the battery plate here there's a little warning here saying that you need to put a 26 volt battery on. That's very easy to overlook. So what would happen if somebody put a 14.4 or a 14.8 volt V mount onto the light? Well, the light fires up momentarily and then turns off. Now, the only thing to indicate that it's a battery issue is this little flashing battery icon in the top right hand corner, which is very easy to overlook. So I reckon this could lead to a lot of confusion on set, especially in rentals. The last negative for me is to do with the HSI mode. It desaturates to 9,399 Kelvin. So it's quite a blue desaturation point. So if you're looking to use this with other fixtures, it might not match if you're desaturating. All right, so let's go through the pros. So it's actually quite well built, especially for its price. It packs down pretty thin, so you can get quite a few of these into a vehicle. It's quite lightweight, even with a battery on it. And if you're looking for something that can give you full saturated colors in the background, this isn't too bad at that. It's got quite a bit of firepower in its RGB mode. And if you're uh, starting to get into professional work and you can't afford anything better, this does have DMX. So as you get more equipment down the track that's more professional, this can integrate up to a certain point. All right, now let's uh, have a look at this thing over DMX. Now, as far as I can tell, it's only got one DMX profile, which is a four channel master profile. So channel one selects what mode you're running in and channel two is always your brightness. So it's a very basic profile to run over a small lighting desk or something like that if you can't afford any computerization. Four channels only. And the other thing too is when you're doing your adjustments on your DMX controller, you can see what's happening up on the screen. So it's very easy to figure out your profiling. All right, so let's uh, switch across to this unit. Uh, one thing I forgot to point out, it's running off Lumen Radio, uh, and the Lumen Radio receiver is being powered off the USB port. All right, so let's have a look at a five second fade to black. Now, with its fades, it is very steppy. All right, so it's not gonna give you fantastic fades up and down over DMX, so that was five seconds. All right, so let's go to two and a half seconds. I mean, by no stretch of the imagination is it the worst I've ever seen, but you know, it's not smooth. Okay, let's have a look at that. Okay, so two and a half second fade to black. Okay, and back up. So, you know, it is, it is quite steppy, but then again, it doesn't cost all that much. Now let's have a look at how the unit switches its CCTs over DMX. So I'm gonna go from two and a half thousand Kelvin to 5,600 Kelvin. All right, so let's have a look at an instant switch. Okay, so it does seem to have a, a little bit of a step or a jerk in the changeover. So it's not fantastic for you know, instant in-camera changeovers. All right, let's have a look at how it goes over a five second transition. So it is a little bit steppy. I'm going back the other way. Yeah, so it is a little bit steppy there. All right, so now let's take a look at the HSI mode over DMX. Now the colors, are very, very rich in this unit, very, very K-pop. So if you're after those sort of rich, uh, vibrant music clip colors, uh, this light can do that quite well. All right, so let's do an instant uh, crossover to green. Okay, so it does that pretty good, but watch what happens when I go back the other way. So it has this step over where it seems to go to white light and then back to red. So uh, going one way seems to be fine, but if I go back the other way, there just seems to be this step over to, to, to white light from colored light. All right, let's do a transition between the two over five seconds. Let's have a look at that. All right, so that's looking pretty smooth. I'm pretty impressed with that. Um, that's, that's not too bad at all. All right, let's go back the other way. All right, that's not too bad, particularly for the price. All right, let's uh, have a look now. Same thing at about two and a half seconds. Okay, let's give that a go. All right, not too bad, not too shabby. Let's go back the other way. All right, that's looking, that's looking pretty good. 
All right, now let's uh, have a look at the special effects. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna have a look at the candle mode just to show you how that works, or the fire mode. All right, so let's pop into the special effects now. All right, so I can do things like I can adjust the flicker rate over my DMX, okay, quite easily. And I can do things like adjust my brightness. So overall, the DMX is a bit of a mixed bag, but for a $1,000 light, it's not too bad. All right, so let's start going through all the technical data I've recorded with the unit, starting off with brightness. One meter is on that side, three meters is on that side. So I've taken readings at 3,200 Kelvin, 5,600 Kelvin, red, green, and blue, so knock yourself out. All right, now in terms of all the rest of my data, uh, this unit between 2,500 Kelvin and 3,000 Kelvin really could do it some reprogramming. It is all over the place. But from 3,000 Kelvin and upwards, this is a pretty good unit, especially for the price. All right, so let's get into CCT average accuracies. All right, so between 3,000 and 4,000 Kelvin, it is out by typically plus or minus only 22 Kelvin. Between 4,000 and 5,000 Kelvin, it is typically over by on average 37 Kelvin. And between 5,000 and 6,000 Kelvin, it is typically out by only plus or minus 28 Kelvin. Now let's have a look at our average TM30 color render scores. Between 3,000 and 4,000 Kelvin, it averaged 93.8. Between 4,000 and 5,000 Kelvin, it averaged 93.7. And between 5,000 and 6,000 Kelvin, it also averaged 93.7. Now let's have a look at our white points. So between 3,000 and 4,000 Kelvin, it was typically out by plus or minus 0.0009 Delta UV. Between 4,000 and 5,000 Kelvin, it was typically out by plus 0.0014. And between 5,000 and 6,000 Kelvin, it rides in between the Planckian curve and the daylight curve, plus 0.0036 Delta UV. Let's take a closer look at some of the Kelvins, starting off with the lowest Kelvin we can dial in. When I dialed in 2,500 Kelvin, I got 2,708, with a TN30 color vector score of 95% average accuracy, with an average 101% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores, and only R12 is below 90. And here is the spectral distribution. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin, I got 3,229 with an SSI score of 84. TM30 came in with an average 94% color accuracy with an average 102% saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectral distribution and the Delta UV came in at plus 0.0013, which means it's out by roughly the equivalent of a 1 16th correction gel. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,421. The TM30 color vector suggests an average 94% color accuracy with an average 103% saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R9 and R12 were below 90. This is the spectral distribution and the Delta UV was off by plus 0.0011. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got 5,610 with an SSI score of 72. The TM30 color results were 93% average color accuracy with an average 102% saturation. Here are the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. This is the spectral distribution and the Delta UV came in at plus 0.0018, which puts it quite a bit above the Planckian curve, but very close to the daylight curve. When I dialed in the top Kelvin of 8,500 Kelvin, I got 8,052. The TM30 suggests an average color accuracy of 92% with an average saturation of 99%. Here are the CRI scores, R9, R10 and R12 were all below 90. And here is the spectral distribution. All right, let's have a look at how this light dials in its color vectors. Red, which should be zero, came in at one degree. Green, which should be 120 degrees, was smack on target. Blue was also smack on at 240 degrees. Yellow, which should be 60, came in at 48 degrees. Cyan, which should be 180 degrees, came in at 201 degrees. And magenta, which should be 300, came in at 284. Now, I'm not gonna give you results for how accurately it desaturates because it desaturates to 9,399 Kelvin. So I have no standard to measure it against. 
I'm Andrew Locke, see you on the next episode of Gaffering Gear.